Well, that was the first year of the expansion. So I remember sitting at home and uh, hearing my name called to go to Los Angeles Kings. And that was really exciting that time because the old six team league, you, it was gonna be tough to break in with the Boston Bruins or anybody at that time. So when I got chosen by Los Angeles King, Terry Sawchuk was our number one guy. Eh? Then after that, we didn't have a lot of NHL guys on our roster. And uh, so when I looked at the lineup, I knew I had a chance you know, of playing in the NHL. And so that was really exciting. But what was exciting was the man who owned us was Jack Kent Cook, who owned the Washington Redskins and the uh, LA Lakers at that time. He drafted, he bought the list of Eddie Shore from Springfield. So when we went to training camp, there had to be 80 guys at camp because, as you remember, Eddie Shore kind of blackballed all the guys. He just buried them in the minors. A lot of guys from Winnipeg, Bobby Foles, and guys that played one or two games, and Shore never released them because they could never go play even amateur hockey somewhere. And so when we got to camp, you really didn't know who everybody was, but guys were showing up with rust on their skates, and we'd have a team pitcher, individual pitchers, they'd be wiping out the photographer, and guys were just there to have a few beers, hadn't skated in years. Eh? So when I got to L.A., once I saw the lineup, I could skate pretty good, and I realized somebody had told me, whatever you do, Wally Hergesheimer, the old pro from, I worked with him at the liquor store in Winnipeg, and Hergie said, make somebody notice you every day. And so I could skate, so I remember I just tried to win the races up and down, stops and starts. And so I was lucky to get picked on that team. We were six weeks at camp, and uh, no money living on coupons to go get food, no car to get the food. So it was not what I expected. It was uh, in Guelph and we had a, uh, my room, I had a, uh, a rope as a fire escape and everything else. And worst thing I did though, is I got a hole in one and the day before camp. And I'm afraid I went out and had a few beers. I got in at 11.15, 11 o'clock was curfew and Red Kelly was a coach and Larry Reagan. So they fined me the first day. So I remember my first contract was $10,500 because I had been out 50 minutes late. Eh? When I got to LA, I was a leading scorer. I played with Brian Kilray and Lowell McDonald. I was a leading scorer, and they called me in with one month. They said, here's your $1,000 back. Just don't go drinking anymore and you, you know, whatever else. So, so it was an exciting time to go to LA, and we never played in the LA form for the first while. We played in Long Beach. Unfortunately, we got to LA. Larry Reagan was our general manager. When we got there, we had no money, no cars, no place to live, and he just, uh, he was gonna teach us a lesson. So thankfully for Terry Sawchuk, he phoned the owner of the team, he said, I'm going home, you can't treat these kids like that, I will not stay here. And uh, Jack Kent Cook came down the next day, all our checks were there, keys to the cars, places to live and everything else. Larry was just trying to teach us a lesson there. Eh? And thank goodness for Terry Sawchuk, because we were eating crackers out of the hotel. We had nothing, we didn't have money. Our wives were driving down at that time to stay at one hotel and they changed the hotel on the, uh, on the air, on the, in the air on the way to LA. So our wives were arriving in LA and we couldn't get hold of them. And it was an awkward situation. And uh, Red Kelly didn't know what was happening and uh, it was unfair of Larry to do that. But thank goodness for Terry Sawchuk for standing up for us. I always respect him, appreciate him for that. Well, it was exciting, and we realized nobody knew who we were because we played at a Long Beach arena until they got the forum done, eh? And uh, when Montreal came into town or Toronto, the place had ten or 12,000 people, but it was all Montreal sweaters or Toronto sweaters. Nobody knew who we were, okay? So when we went on the road, if we went back out east to New York or Chicago, our meal money was more than our salaries in a lot of cases, eh? So we became a close group of guys because we took on most of the Springfield hockey team, which was Brian Kilray, who was key to us, because Brian was the first guy who bought Al Eagleson in NA too. So their Springfield team had won championship, and they could do things on their skates, no matter what they said about Eddie Shore. He taught those guys how to do some things on skates. So we stuck pretty close together. Bill White and you know, Amadale and Hank Hamm, we had a good bunch of guys, but we were on the road for a long time. So, so it was fun and uh, we were competitive and we made the playoffs and uh, it, it was exciting times at that time and uh, uh, just that we knew that nobody knew we were up there. Outstanding, outstanding. I remember my first game against Detroit, Terry Sawchuk said, kid, if you play against Gordy Hall, look out for him, he's dirty. 
Well, who do I face off against? My first shift is Gordy Howe, and he looks at me, and it's hot in that rink. And he said, geez, because they were hot here. It'd be nice for a gold, cold beer after the game. And I said, yes, wackle right in the head with an elbow. And Terry saw Chuck, he said, I told you, watch out for that dirty old so-and-so. Well, then Ferguson come into town, Montreal Canadiens, and you know, all that stuff. And then going to Detroit with, I was lucky I played in all the old original six buildings, New York, the old garden, and uh, you know, skate into Montreal, and there you see Belleville and Cornwall. I saw Ivan Cornwall this summer. I said, Van, do you remember that first game you got four goals against us? You're playing with Belleville. He says, that's all I got against you guys? You're terrible. And we chased uh, Belleville around because he was the epitome of an athlete. I mean, he just looked so good. And going into you know, Chicago, and you got Bobby Hall. I mean, it would just, I mean, Detroit with Gordy Howe. I got traded to Detroit from New, from Los An or to L.A. from from L.A. First game, Howe knocked out two of my contact lenses. Eh? And, but those are all the guys. Toronto, I went offside, and I heard the George Armstrong from the bench. He said, hey, kid, you're in the NHL. The puck goes across the blue line first. Eh? You're mortified, national TV. Eh? But those are all the guys. Going to Boston, they ran the heck right out of you. I mean, it was intimidating. Teddy Green, I'm from Winnipeg, so what? He'd kill you, that type of thing. It was the most exciting time to be able to skate in those original six, to hear the fans and... It just brought back all the things as a kid. You're saying, gee, I wish I could play, and you did. And there you were skating around with those guys. And in warm-ups, you try to take a slap shot and impress the people, you know, type of thing. It was exciting. I remember them vivid, vivid, vivid times. Chicago Stadium to this day rings echoes in my mind because you dress in the basement, eh? And all of a sudden, they played. They had that big old organ, and they had that... You had to come up these stairs, and you got to ice level. And all you heard was, here comes the Hawks, the mighty Blackhawks. And it just verberated around the whole, you know, you just, it was so exciting. It was just really awesome. All the things you dreamt of as a kid. <laughs> yeah, well, it was. Well, then you think you had a, well, like St. Louis, so you had Scotty Bowen behind the bench, and they had a lot of veteran guys, you know, Glenn Hall and Jacques Blount, and you knew you were playing some pretty good hockey there. Philly, they were running in those days. But going to Oakland and stuff like that, I mean, you could light a firework, fireworks in there. Nobody was in the building in that. So, now nah, the original six was special, still is to me.